it's completely conceivable to me that there is some part of the world where somebody is paying money to walk into a room and kill somebody as a sexual act. There's no greater controversy, no greater taboo than snuff murders. I think anything that people will pay money for exists in the world. And if people want to pay for snuff, snuff will exist. I'm sure in the age of video, one exists somewhere, but I don't think it's being circulated. I think that in a, in a sense, snuff is like the holy grail, much talked about, long sought after, but never found. The existence of snuff movies remains one of the most enduring of urban legends. Persistent rumors of an underground industry continue to concern police around the world, so much so that the FBI have even developed their own definition of what a snuff movie is. The key elements, number one, it has to be a visual depiction. It could be still pictures, moving images, whatever. On this visual image, someone was alive at the beginning and they're dead at the end. The motivation for the murder is because the script requires it. And this visual image is being put together for the sexual gratification of viewers. And people look at this to get sexually aroused. And then the final element is that this visual depiction is commercially distributed. Snuff has been a cinematic bogeyman for over a quarter of a century and has its roots in one of the most shocking murder sprees in criminal history. Of movie director Roman Polanski. It was his wife, Sharon Tate, who was one of the victims. In August 1969, Sharon Tate, the heavily pregnant wife of film director Roman Polanski, was murdered. These murders occurred on October, August the 9th on Cielo Drive in West Los Angeles. The killers, Charles Manson and his followers, then went on a deadly rampage, supposedly filming as they went. Those films were never retrieved by the police, and the rumors spread that copies were being bought and sold on the black market. Snuff as applied to a movie obviously relates to the idea that someone is snuffed out like a candle, i.e. killed. Seven years later, Alan Shackleton decided to exploit these rumors, buying a low-budget film called Slaughter, based on the Manson family murders, in which a gang of female hippies go on a killing spree. The film's rough and ready shooting style and terrible acting gave it a limited appeal, but Shackleton would add a new and controversial final scene that would give birth to the legend of snuff. So Alan rented my studio and hired a film crew to come in. Then you two go and show me. They tried to match the last scene in the movie. They shot this little special effects scene where uh, the girl is slaughtered, uh, supposedly by the film crew. Why well, don't you and I go over to the bed and we'll, we'll get turned on, we'll turn each other on, huh? With all these people watching. The camera pulls out from the last scene of the original movie to reveal what appears to be behind-the-scenes footage of the production crew. But instead of being a seamless continuation, it feels more like the start of a different film. Nothing matches no, the, the actors or the film stock or anything like that. And then a woman is uh, duped into, you know, getting a little amorous with the director on a bed. What are you doing? And then he he's murders her on camera in close-up. He cuts off her finger, and then he takes a little jigsaw. Go get the ripsaw. Cuts off her wrist. From there on down was a phony arm, and it was joined right at the wrist. And the actor put his hand over the join so you couldn't see it. So her hand was gripping his hand, and they had the jigsaw would cut through the phony arm. It was actually very amateurish because uh, 
after the, the uh, arm was cut off, the hand is still moving. The special effects are really cheesy. Dime store, rubber hand, raspberry syrup, uh, blood. Pretty much was laughable and, and dull. The action climax is when the director snuffs out the actress by ripping her stomach open and disemboweling her. She was actually lying in a hollowed out section of the bed and her, her body went from about here down underneath this layer of pig and beef intestines that were in a mannequin. And he reaches in and just lifts uh, this massive offal. Pulls it up as if it was real. To maintain the illusion that audiences are seeing footage meant for the cutting room floor... Shit, we ran out of film, shit. The film simply ends when the camera runs out of film. We got it all. Yeah, let's get out of here. Despite the crudity of the effects, the idea behind Snuff was irresistible to audiences. The film opened on Broadway and was an instant smash at the box office, outgrossing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest for three weeks in a row. It was a phenomenon. People really believed that they were seeing the first uh, real snuff film caught on, you know, caught on film live. Shackleton didn't market the film as a real snuff movie, but he didn't deny it was one either, and his outrageous methods of promotion guaranteed the film was a success. I think he alerted a lot of these women's uh, rights groups about the film just to get them in outraged, uh, which they were, and they picketed and all the newspapers showed up, and a lot of people fell for it. There were people on television calling it pornography and the uh, fall of civilization as we know it. But what started as a publicity stunt was soon accepted as fact by the general public. And the legend was given even more credence by the movies that followed. And by crazed fans who decided to make life imitate art. The release of the film Snuff in 1976 had established a new genre of film where people were supposedly killed on camera for the entertainment of others. Hollywood soon began to cash in on the phenomenon with mainstream releases like Hardcore. Hardcore is a very powerful film about a minister who is looking for his daughter, who's been engulfed in the porno industry. And you know, this uh, straight-laced guy has to get, go into this underground to try to rescue his daughter, and he has to kind of wallow in the filth. Released in 1979, Hardcore reinforced the idea that an active criminal network existed that produced and distributed snuff movies. A film like this, eight millimeter film, cost two or three hundred dollars to make. Sold out right in a store. Shown in peat machines. It's impossible to track down. Nobody makes it. Nobody shows it. Nobody sees it. It's like it doesn't even exist. In his search for his daughter, the main character, played by George C. Scott, reluctantly watches her in a porn movie and then has to sit through a fictional snuff film to find out if she's in it. You know, shot in a way by Paul Schrader to, so you believe that this is, this stuff exists on the underground. This is what it looks like. There's a couple in, in this grainy footage. He's stabbed in the stomach and then the, wife, the girlfriend has her throat slit. And it's, it's pretty realistic and graphic because uh, the, the fact it's so crude. And then we feel the revulsion of the main character because we're kind of complicit in the scene as well because we're watching him watching it. And it's just very gr disgusting and very upsetting. A year later, the underground exploded into the mainstream with the release of Cannibal Holocaust, whose stunning panoramas and memorable score mysteriously belied the savagery of its content. 
Cannibal Holocaust falls into the category of a movie that's so low budget you kind of believe it's real. And then you look at the people they use and they use real cannibals and like jungle savages when they film this. You think what monster made this movie? The courts accused me of really killing and torturing people. A court wanted to see the film with me, so they took me to a special room. Immediately from the judge's reaction, because he grimaced every time he saw a shocking scene, I could see that I would be convicted. The film opened in Italy on the 8th of February 1980 and caused uproar. It appeared to show documentary footage where people were beheaded, castrated and eaten by cannibals. It resulted in it being banned in Italy and Britain. Four youngsters who never came back. But let's have a look at them at the beginning of their incredible... The movie centers on four documentary makers who disappear in the South American jungle whilst filming a study of local cannibals. Then their footage and bodies are found by a shocked rescue party. The shaky camera work and haphazard direction exactly mirror the kind of footage an observational documentary team would shoot. One of the most controversial moments in the film is when the crew discover the impaling of one of the cannibals. And I have watched the scene over and over with a girl impaled on a pole, and we thought that has to be real. Like, of course they took a dead body and just shoved a pole on it. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's horrible. That scene is one of the grossest images ever, you know, recorded for any film. It was pretty uh, unpleasant and nasty, but it, it was a powerful moment. When the film made its way to the UK in the early 80s, the lack of video licensing laws meant it was freely circulated, and many thought a genuine snuff movie had finally surfaced. There was a policeman who, who publicly said he'd seen a snuff movie and it was called Cannibal Holocaust. And that was part of what caused the sort of uh, uh, moral panic about video Nazis, was this, this view that children could get access to this material and there was nothing in law to stop them. The director of public prosecutions responded to the resulting public outcry by banning the film. The DPP set up a list of videos which were approved for prosecution and that became known as the, the Video Nasty List. Um, and and that, that persisted until 1984 when the Video Recordings Act established regulation of all videos in the UK. Blurring the line between fact and fiction had serious consequences for the director when the Italian authorities put him on trial for the murder of the actors. I originally had a contract with the actors where they were asked to disappear for a year. But when I was in court on murder charges and things were going really badly, I had to bring one of them back to testify. Diodato was pretty much a genius at Try, the way he tried to fool the audience with the camera running out of film and stuff like that. They, yeah, he was very clever. As unpleasant as the film is and as, as crude as it is, you know, he does have a, a pretty good grip of the cinematic technique. By appropriating the techniques of the documentary world, Diodato had skillfully persuaded audiences into thinking they were watching real, uncut scenes. This is especially true of the last footage shot by the documentary crew in which they capture their own murders. You look at the people they use, and they use real cannibals and like jungle savages when they film this. How do you direct a bunch of cannibals in Colombia, in the jungle? How do you do that? Just that alone seemed to me like, I, it was just, it just felt like some of it had to be real. There's no laws, no one's watching them. 
you just, you, it just gives you this really creepy feeling. To avoid jail, the director even had to reveal the secret behind the famous impaling scene, which had duped many into believing it was real. Like, what crew member could say, hey, I'm going to stick a pole up your ass, it's going to come out your mouth, and you're going to sit there naked for a minute on camera covered in mud? Like, who would allow themselves to do that? And she doesn't move. You don't see her blink, you don't see anything. I just don't know how they did that shot. <laughs> Special effects gave me a pole with a bicycle seat on it. The pole was put into the ground. The girl sat on the seat and she had a rod of light balsa wood in her mouth. Then everything was covered in blood to hide the seat. The way they faked that scene and other scenes in the movie uh, were you know, something that Hollywood special effects guys probably couldn't duplicate with millions of dollars. The outcry caused by cannibal holocaust and the public's belief in a real trade in snuff compelled the police to investigate. Throughout the 80s, it was Michael Haynes's job as head of the obscene publications department to uncover the truth. We dealt with the most extreme end of, if you like, the market, the porn market. So we were constantly seeing terrible scenes of sadomasochism. And there was always a suggestion that in amongst all this, we would find a snuff movie. And so we're always aware, you know, and alive to that possibility. Haynes's inquiries uncovered The Flower of Flesh and Blood, a film thought by many to be the first example of real snuff. It follows a sadistic samurai as he butchers a young woman in his secret lair. Made for the gore-hungry Japanese market in 1985, it was not only promoted as a snuff film, but its brutality suggested it to be one. Here he comes. Watching uh, a, ch a Japanese warrior who is cutting off the hand of a woman, or what appears to be um, very unpleasant, um, unpleasant in the extreme. The flower of flesh and blood not only found its way to Scotland Yard, but it also made it to LA, where a Hollywood actor saw it and was convinced it was a real snuff film. A gentleman who was writing for Fangoria at the time, he used to get all these extreme movies, including this guinea pig film from Japan, and he turned some friends on to it, who showed it to Charlie Sheen, who he was working with at the time. Charlie Sheen uh, thought the film was real and went to the FBI with it. The film is so anatomically accurate that it's almost impossible to tell if it's real or not. This realism extends to the clinical method of dissection, complete with gruesome sound effects. When I hear that this celebrity looked at a film and said that it was the real thing, that causes me to become more skeptical about the allegation. So a lot of times what they're reporting is the myth and the legend of the snuff film, and they dramatize that, exaggerate, and embellish it. The flower of flesh and blood was discovered to be a sophisticated fake, but it remains one of the most convincing in the history of snuff. It's extremely, um, extremely nasty. I'm looking at uh, the dismembered head of uh, the young girl, and the Japanese man who did that is now licking the blood off her face. Gross. The film caused such a stir in Japan that in 1986, using behind-the-scenes footage, the making of Guinea Pig was released to show how they created the incredibly realistic special effects. The body parts mutilated by the samurai were in fact all prosthetic. I'm <laughs> 
It isn't. It isn't genuine. But it looks bloody real. But the audiences loved it. At a time when Cannibal Holocaust was outselling ET in Japan, Flower of Flesh and Blood rocketed into the top ten video sales. But the effects of its success took a sinister turn when in 1988 it was once again at the centre of a police investigation, fueling the debate over the link between real life and screen violence. Anybody who might be aroused by someone dying could have those arousal patterns fueled and reinforced by looking at snuff, a simulated snuff type film. <laughs> Sutomo Miyazaki had abducted and killed four little girls aged four to seven to satisfy his strange desires. He was finally caught in July 1989, attempting to kidnap his fifth victim. Amongst the 27-year-old's extensive video library was a copy of Flower of Flesh and Blood. Inspired by his favorite scenes from the movie, Miyazaki reenacted them on his victims, filming their torture, dismemberment, and murder. But despite being inspired by a fake snuff movie, Miyazaki's own recording is not considered to be an example of the real thing. Where this person was not killed for production value, this person was killed for the sexual gratification of this violent sex offender. And after the visual record is made, it's not for commercial distribution, but those are not snuff films. After seven long years, Miyazaki was deemed sane and was sentenced to death by hanging. After a decade of hype and hysteria, a genuine snuff film had yet to be found. But subsequent movies made it even harder for audiences and police to tell whether they were watching the real thing or not. The arrival of cheap home video cameras would mean snuff could finally become reality. Professional and amateur videos reporting to show assaults and murders, including so-called snuff videos, are different from the type of material which is readily available. In the 1980s, the availability of cheap home video cameras enabled the general public to capture life and death images as they happened in a way that wasn't previously possible. It signaled a new direction in the story of snuff. For the first time in cinema history, the greatest fear... The birth of the 80s saw faces of death emerge from the underground. It claimed to be a compilation of the most graphic images ever recorded including scenes from accidents, executions, and mortuaries. This film came out at a time when nobody had done anything like this before. It came out at a time when this dark uh, journey into the unknown uh, had never really been explored on such an exploitive level. Faces of Death compiled the news clips deemed too extreme to show on TV or in cinemas, such as this police shootout, where the hostage taker is brutally gunned down on camera. It broke new ground by showing actual clips of real life tragedy caught on home video, like this fatal parachute accident, which is all the more shocking for being real. Faces of Death was banned in 46 countries, including the UK. The more controversial something is, the more people are told they can't have it, the more they want it. And thus, you know, banning Faces of Death was probably the greatest press it could ever have. The reason audiences were so convinced by Faces of Death was its clever use of real and mocked up clips, all shot on the same cheap cameras available to any member of the public. I bought footage of a woman who was committing suicide jumping off a building. That footage was about 40 seconds, so what we did is we shot inserts, video inserts of firemen running up the stairs, and then cut to her out front, and then all of a sudden she jumps. And then we see her drop to the ground, and then we did an insert shot with another actress with brains on the sidewalk. 
much of the footage is faked. Um, although for the, the casual viewer, I think it's quite difficult to work out sometimes what's faked and what's not. Many people were duped by the electric chair scene, which isn't real either. It's time. We built a, an electric chair. We went up to Chino, we hired an actor to play this, this guy who's on death row. Good luck, Joe. And then we cut to, as he turns the corner, we cut to the, a cell which we had built in a friend's loft. The process is simple. The victim is placed in a chair where electrodes are attached to his leg and head. And they tape his eyes and, and they strap them into the chair. His eyes are taped to prevent them from popping out of their sockets. And then we line the guy's mouth with toothpaste. We had tubes going around the back of his head, hidden by the tape, so that when he actually got zapped... I was calling out, all right, here we go. He would just have these convulsions, and eventually we had makeup guys squeezing blood. We had toothpaste coming out of his mouth. And the guy gave a really, a, an Academy Award-winning performance. And that's why, to this day, people actually think we actually got footage of an electric chair execution. If you go out and you put your money down to get a film in which people are dying, there's a tendency for you to just kind of accept, hey, this is cool, people are dying in here. And are you really using your critical thinking skills to whatever extent you have them? A lot of times people are not prepared to do that. The final trickle of blood marked the conclusion to this grotesque execution. Because it contains some real and disturbing images of dying, Faces of Death was reported as a snuff movie. Faces of Death is not a snuff film. A snuff film is when somebody is, is murdered on camera and it's really just down, out, down and dirty murder and sex. Faces of Death is an exploration into death. And no one was murdered to, to expedite death in our film. More than 15 years after Snuff's release, and despite there being no documented case of a real Snuff movie, the belief that they were out there persisted, and the myth gained greater credibility by the actions of depraved individuals like Alec Doughty. In the porn industry, we had quite a few informants, and one of them got in touch with us to say that Doughty had been in touch with him saying that he wanted to murder, torture two prostitutes and record it on film. We had our undercover guy, who we'll call Todd, get in touch with him uh, and they arranged a meeting at a bar at Euston Station and this guy started to talk about, quite freely, what he wanted to do. They would snatch the girls off the street um, drug them with chloroform, take them to a location which they were discussing, and to torture them and kill them. All the time we were saying that, you know, this, this must just be pure fantasy, but, but it got to the stage where he actually, he started to draw the implements themselves, and then at one meeting he gave Todd some liquid. I mean, we had it tested, it was noxious substance. So he was getting towards the act. He then gave Todd a name and telephone number of a woman in South London. And we made inquiries and found out that she was, in fact, a prostitute and she existed. We thought, we can't let this go on anymore. We arrested him and he was dealt with under the Mental Health Act. He was a very dangerous man. If he'd succeeded and the police hadn't been involved, then clearly that would have been a snuff movie. Um, yeah, absolutely. Alec Doughty had the desire, but lacked the ability. But whereas in the past, movie production required expensive kit and highly trained crew, amateur filmmakers were now able to direct their own films with cheap home video cameras. Jeffrey Jones did just that in April 1986, when he recorded himself murdering a young girl. Jeffrey Jones was charged with murder. He had hanged his victim, and he had done so under the pretense uh, of making a serious film of a decent nature, whereas, in fact, he had set out to make what in modern parlance would be called a snuff movie. 
Jones used his own home as a filming location. He lived in a suburban house on the outskirts of Birmingham, and in some ways it's almost bizarre that the ordinariness and decency of the, of the whole neighbourhood, there should be a house in it where the attic had been set up for such bizarre behaviour. Jones attracted would-be actress Marion Terry to his home with an advertisement in his local newsagents to make a film called Enough Rope. He described making a film which was going to culminate with a fake scene of hanging. The rope was uh, over a beam and a hook in the attic of Jones's house. Whilst the camera was turning, she would be standing on the chair, the noose round her neck, and it was at this point that he must quite deliberately have kicked the chair away from under her. In court, Jones insisted Marion's death was an accident and he was merely filming a simulated hanging. I expect he would have uh, anticipated that she would have hung there alive, struggling for her life for let us say five or ten minutes, uh, just the very stuff of the perverts of snuff movies. The film Jones was making has never been found. I have a theory of my own that because he was so deeply into all these versions, he may have been in contact, some sort of network, of people who were interested in snuff movies. Uh, so, in other words, the film may have been made not merely for his own uh, bizarre gratification, but actually for the purpose of making money out of it. If somebody has made a snuff movie, then they're not really going to show it to the world at large. That's direct, first-hand evidence of the murder being committed. You would be more likely to just keep it hidden. Despite the lack of video evidence, the jury were quick to find Jones guilty of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. To take the life of any other human being deliberately is an horrific act. But to do it in such a calculated, bizarre way and to want to make and create a record of your doing so, perhaps the word monster is not wholly out of place. Alec Doughty had the intention of producing a snuff film, but was arrested before he could do it. Jeffrey Jones had made a tape that was never found. But a case in Germany suggested the snuff movie industry might be more than just an urban myth. Stefan M, 28, and Malik K, 35, had heard that for pornos with echten, ungestellten gewalt scenes, sogenannte snuff videos, viel Geld gezahlt würde. In November 1997, the two men kidnapped a 24-year-old prostitute from the Christmas market in Dortmund. They tortured her in front of their video camera, but she escaped and led the police to a farmhouse near Hagen, where they were to discover something far worse. During the course of the investigations, a body was found on the property. A 21-year-old Turkish woman who was a prostitute had been severely tortured prior to her death and had also been sexually abused. On further investigation, they found a small torture chamber fitted out with carpet, so no one could hear the screams when they videoed their victim. They also found a tape. The two minutes and three seconds on the video film that was seized made it clear what the perpetrators had done to her. You can see that the victim had to suffer the most agonizing pain for many hours. This has been amongst the most violent thing of this nature that police officers and myself have ever seen. The prostitute had been brutally killed. The murdered woman's body was found very tightly bound. Her head was totally wrapped in tear-proof sticky tape. Due to these circumstances, she died through suffocation. 
Ernst Dieter Corzen was the sadistic torturer of the duo. A psychiatric report on him found that beatings and abuse were a regular part of his childhood. During this period, his experiences led to a strong connection in his mind between fear, pain and also lust. In April 1999, Corzen and Mann were jailed for life, becoming the first people in Europe to be convicted of murder while producing a snuff movie, which they'd hoped to sell in the USA for $16,000. It seems that the disturbing truth behind why no snuff movie had ever appeared before was that criminals had lacked the means to make one, but not the intent. If you go back to the Moors murderers, um, Hindi and Brady, when they killed those children, they recorded the deaths on tape. It's certain, in my mind, that had there been video recorders in those days, they would have recorded those deaths on film as well. So when you think about snuff movies, they were creating snuff audio tapes. So the genre was there. If access to video had given criminals the potential to make their own snuff films, the creation of the internet would unleash enormous numbers of potential buyers. What the internet is, is the greatest invention in the history of mankind for people who have narrow and small sexual interests, or really any interest, to find each other. San Jose police were amongst the first to recognize the dangers of the net. At the beginning of 1989, a detective pioneered going undercover in cyberspace by posing as a bisexual paedophile. He went on a sex bulletin board where he met Dean Lambie, 33, and later Daniel Depew, 27. These were two individuals who began to communicate with each other about the possibility of kidnapping a child and making a snuff film. During a six-month relationship, the two Virginia men developed a plot to kidnap a boy from the northern end of their state. The plan was to keep him in captivity for two weeks, repeatedly molest him, each time torturing him to just short of death, eventually murder him and videotape the whole thing. Why would you trust somebody you just started to talk to on the internet? This is not a smart thing to do, particularly when you're talking about abducting and murdering people. But again, it's this need for validation. A lot of these people communicate with each other because what they want somebody to say is, you know what I'm thinking about doing? I'm thinking about abducting a kid, torturing him, killing him, and filming it. Now, if you say that to your next door neighbor, they say to you, you sick weirdo, what's wrong with you? I'm calling the police. The anonymity of the internet lulled the duo into a false sense of security. These individuals were placed under elaborate surveillance and monitored and watched. In August 1989, when Lambie told the undercover police officer he had spotted a likely 13-year-old victim riding his bike and that he intended to carry out the plan at his Richmond home, police and the FBI were forced to act. Are we going to wait till he grabs the kid and gets him in the car and then we're going to arrest him before they get to the location where they were going to kill him? I don't think so. So you have to move in pretty quickly. Their plot, hatched on the internet, was foiled and the two men are serving 30 years in federal prisons. Although Depew and Lambie were convicted, the increasing access to technology would make it easier and easier to capture death on camera and to distribute it without fear of being caught. Cyberspace, with all of its global opportunities, was calling, and snuff was not about to turn away. With the invention of the internet, snuff found its natural home. Any kind of deprivation was available online, and tracing those who put it there was complex and difficult. If a genuine snuff movie was ever to surface, this is where it would be found. 
But the innovators in this area came from an unlikely source. No, I mean, the closest thing I saw to a snuff film was one of those Al-Qaeda decapitations, and that was enough. Now you literally could go on your computer and type Al-Qaeda Daniel Pearl and click a video and watch this guy getting decapitated. And it's real. And it's horrifying. I can watch endless decapitations in movies because I know it's theater. It's a magic trick. When we see people like Nick Berg and Daniel Pearl murdered on camera or, or pictures of it in the newspaper, you know, that tops anything that Hollywood could come up with. Because now, you know, the, the filmmakers are the terrorists who are making their own snuff movies and, and holding the world hostage with images of, of real horror. The deaths in Iraq where people have been beheaded are probably not snuff movies as such. Um, they are films that are being made for different purposes, the purpose being to frighten us all um, and as, as a weapon of terror. But evidence that technology is enabling snuff to become a reality emerged in October 2004. A 37-year-old man lost his life to the latest phenomenon sweeping Britain, known as happy slapping, where acts of violence are recorded on mobile phones. People are getting some sort of uh, gratification, not necessarily sexual gratification, but, but they're getting gratification and so-called fun. Another one, another one. Another one. From torturing other people. Um, and in the South Bank incident, obviously that was to the nth degree. David Morley, a survivor of the Admiral Duncan pub bombing in Soho, became the random victim of a violent London gang. Who was killed on the South Bank by a group of teenagers who were filming the attacks that they were making on people on their mobile telephones. The teenage girl shouted, we're doing a documentary on happy slapping. Then the attack on the pair began. Mr Morley was repeatedly kicked and beaten. He suffered 44 separate injuries, and as he lay helpless on the ground, his head was kicked like a football. The gang were arrested and prosecuted, and in January 2006, their sentence was handed down. Today, the gang of four youths found guilty of David Morley's murder were sentenced to between 8 and 12 years in prison. Had the gang charged their mates to look at what they produced, they would have had the perverse pleasure of fulfilling all the criteria required to define a film as snuff. Now, 30 years after Shackleton released his film Snuff, Mainstream cinema is again exploring the concept. On this, on this website that I saw, you could just walk in into a room and shoot someone in the head. Eli Roth's new film called Hostel is based on a real website where users can supposedly pay $10,000 to travel to Thailand and kill someone for kicks. I think I'm pushing the envelope in terms of, oh my god, this could really happen. I mean, we have such horrible atrocities happening to these people. And there's no monster. It's all done very realistic, and it's actually really disturbing. Um, but I'm never claiming that it's real. As in Hostel, no one dies for real in Snuff Movie. It supports the argument that because it's now possible to make an utterly convincing fake, there's no need to take the risk of actually killing someone. Gentlemen, please join me. I want to show like a Just magician who's broken the code what the tricks are. <laughs> it's the Dr. Strangelove of snuff movies because I think it's kind of humorous and piss takey. What is this candid fucking camera? But at the oh, same boring. time, <laughs> uncomfortable makes you a little queasy. The climax of the film, you purportedly see people physically harmed and tortured. You think this woman is having her head shaved and she's being tattooed. 
You think the guy's being, for sure, stabbed in his torso. It's done in a way that it's hard to believe it's not really going on. But I can assure you it's fake. Yes, they will never release this movie. They don't need to. Because it'll be everywhere. All over the net. It'll be passed on from computer to computer. Unstoppable. I've seen all kinds of films, and most people have seen films, where for every standard that anybody is aware of, it looks like someone was murdered. Why risk killing somebody when you can make it look like you killed somebody? And to the viewer who wants to believe this, they're going to believe it. And yet, the possibilities opened up by internet and mobile technology means there is less risk attached than ever in creating snuff for real. It now seems only a matter of time before a verified example comes to light. This is a theme that really doesn't seem to go away. It works quite well as a plot in a horror movie. Um, whether such things really exist, who knows? The possibilities of recording things on film is as extensive as the human imagination is at its most perverse. It's something about mankind, that there are some people that have the ability to do that to another human being, to take their life. I'm not suggesting that there has never been a snuff film or never will be a snuff film. Certainly, this is in the realm of possibility. I wouldn't be surprised if there really is some kind of sick, perverted subculture that watches these films and that the real thing probably is out there. Although the existence of an underground snuff movie industry is yet to be established, the idea of it refuses to go away. Unfounded allegations of snuff were first made against mainstream cinema, but now it seems likely that an amateur filmmaker could be the one to make a real snuff film. The truth is that snuff is probably already out there. We just haven't found it yet. Tomorrow at five past 11, The Real Animal Farm, the story behind a porn film that shocked a generation. Next tonight, back to the late 80s, for raves, naughty nuns, secrets and spies. What the censors wanted banned in the UK.